uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Glad to have you. Um, like Sean said, we don't do this this early uh, most of the time. In fact, this is the first time we've ever done one this early. Uh, but 200 some odd people signed up for this class. So all of you are apparently as anxious to uh, kind of get on with the gardening year as we are. So uh, that was really good to see. So um, anyway, so we're going to get going. Uh, this picture you see here is um, when you, you start thinking about a, a, a landscape designed for, you know, uh, to be friendly to wildlife. Uh, and mostly what we're talking about is birds and butterflies and bees and things like that. Uh, this has something like what we're talking about. Uh, local scapes is a uh, great concept. Uh, if you haven't taken the local scapes classes, you, uh, you definitely should look into those. But um, this is one way to do a local scape for sure, is to make it really just kind of a safe haven for uh, uh, for pollinators and, and birds to come on by. Uh, and and for from, from my money, it is dramatically better looking uh, than I think what our standard is. So uh, speaking of, um, so we're just going to get going. So uh, local scaping, uh, as I just said, is just a way of adapting uh, your home landscape to match the local environment, thus the local landscaping. Um, one type of local scaping is use your yard basically as an oasis for wildlife. Um, it's a pit stop for food, nesting spots, otherwise, in otherwise barren land because uh, bluegrass turf, Kentucky bluegrass turf, like we have here, is kind of a kind of a wasteland uh, for uh, most uh, pollinators and birds. Um, so the space you have in your yard has the potential to be home to a lot of different species, uh, birds, pollinators, um, and lots of other things. And, and the more life you bring back to it, the more life you get out of it. Um, and it just kind of makes your uh, makes your house and just uh, this uh, this oasis for life to come back. Uh, and I think uh, that what you'll find is a yard like this doesn't have a lot of life going on uh, with it. Uh, there's not you don't you don't see much going on except for that grass. Um, <laughs> basically, this has nothing to offer. Um, a pollinator, uh, no pollen, no nectar, uh, no place to find, you know, shelter or a place to nest. And so this is the standard we've had for too long. I think this is what local scapes is trying to change. And uh, uh, that's kind of what I like to address today. Um, also, like, for my opinion, this looks, just looks dull. Uh, I think what you're going to see during this presentation is you're going to see a lot of landscapes that look really nice. Um, following the local scapes concept with plants designed uh, to attract uh, the, that wildlife and become really friendly to it. Um, but uh, what I want you to do when you're looking at this picture is I want you to look across the street and down the street and see that basically every yard looks exactly like this. And it really kind of makes this this boring, you know, bland landscape uh, that we uh, end up looking uh, looking at. And also it's boring in the wintertime because this is all you get too in the wintertime is, is now a, a bunch of dead grass. Okay. Okay. But this one, on the other hand, is not boring in the wintertime. Even though this is cold and frozen and there's snow everywhere, uh, this is still a, a kind of an interesting landscape to look at. And if you look close in this picture, you'd see actually a lot of little uh, birds skittering in and out of those uh, of those branches. So why choose a wildlife friendly landscape? Uh, diverse landscapes are just, they're, they're beautiful for one. And they attract all kinds of birds and butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, this is a simple area in a uh, front yard over in West Valley, um, where it was grass uh, before. And when the uh, when the owner of this place um, had gone out and got himself a, a horticulture horticulture degree in college, uh, and then joined uh, Conservation Garden Park, um, he uh, switched out a big track of his front yard to this, and this is actually right in front of the mailbox. This is my yard, if you haven't figured out by the way I'm talking about it, um, and decided I wanted to uh, to uh, practice what we preached here a bit, and this is my uh, this is my first attempt at uh, pulling out the grass and making something better. Uh, this is in front of the community mailbox, because the community mailbox is actually right in front of my house, and uh, I get comments all the time as people come to uh, to get their mail about how nice it is just to, to walk down the street and to, to visit this for a few minutes. So I really think this is just a better way to go than uh, the sea of Kentucky bluegrass. I, it's really kind of the standard here in Utah for so long. So again, why are we choosing this? And this is part of why. The, uh, you go from a kind of a, an empty, you know, kind of a lifeless landscape to one that has uh, flowers and shrubs and uh, nice pretty smells and birds. Uh, the birds come and go, and they flit through there, and it is uh, it brings life, and it brings movement back to your landscape. You know, you you can sit in your window and and uh, 
look out uh, at this landscape as uh, everything is moving and it's uh, it's really a, a wonderful thing. Um, pollinators find turf grass to be just kind of an empty wasteland. There really is nothing in turf grass that uh, is attractive to uh, bees and butterflies. Uh, there's no, there really is no pollen. There's no, uh, nothing to eat there. And it's, you know, this, this kind of this big sea of, of green. And so this becomes a nice alternative uh, to just an empty spot. And if you put the right plants in there, this actually be, can become a, uh, uh, a savior for some uh, endangered creatures for the endangered creatures. Um, this is a monarch butterfly. Monarchs uh, uh, are endangered, especially out here in the West. And the biggest reason is is because of the loss of habitat. And so your yard, and you have this, you know, quarter an acre lot or whatever you've got, um, you could re help recreate some of the habitat that has been lost. And if enough of us do this, uh, we could bring creatures like this back from uh, uh, a potential extinction uh, in the future. So um, uh, this is one of the really the good reasons. Um, another reason to do this, and this is might be a, as good a reason to pick a local scape as a, as a wild scape, but it's water efficient because they're already adapted to Utah's environment. Um, we have what eight acres here now here at the Conservation Garden Park that we water significantly less than most places. Uh, and I spend all day out there maintaining it. And I'm here to tell you, I would rest, much rather take care of this than the, the bluegrass. I spend more time per square foot on that bluegrass than I do taking care of this. I know it's not what people expect and I know it's not uh, what people think. Uh, and it's certainly not no maintenance, but I actually spend a lot less time out here and my time is a bit more enjoyable. But what you do get in exchange is, boy, you get this, you get this uh, a really uh, beautiful landscape uh, for the work you do put in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to be trying to talk about uh, how to bring in uh, pollinators, uh, birds, and other, you know, another uh, nice wildlife to your uh, to your landscape. So we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about the food uh, that you'll need, uh, the shelter, uh, how to maybe get some water in there, and uh, how to provide the nesting sites. And if you can provide all of these, um, inevitably uh, the birds will show up, the the pollinators, the bees, the butterflies will all show up. And if you doubt this at all, come on out to Conservation Garden Park and, and take a look around. We're free. We have eight, eight acres for you to walk through. Uh, there's gardeners out there uh, to answer your questions. And we are in the middle of West Jordan. So it's not like we are in a, uh, a big wild area. We're in the middle, we're just kind of in the middle of the valley. And if we can attract them to here, you can attract them to your yard. So if you wanna see what you can do, just come on out here. And as we're going through this presentation, take a look at the, uh, the photographs. Uh, in this presentation, and they're all taken out here at the Conservation Garden Park over the years. So uh, all of the stuff we know lives here in Salt Lake Valley, and we know will come to your yard as long as you provide the right uh, the right area and the right uh, uh, landscape for it. So uh, food sources, uh, diversity in the food sources that you offer is going to uh, attract different things. Um, the various sizes. Uh, are best because different birds, different pollinators are attracted to different things. I'm going to wave my arms here and get the lights to go back on. Um, the uh, what what's going to attract uh, uh, what's going to be attracted to this sunflower over here? The birds that eat those seeds or the bees that uh, are looking to pollinate that is going to be different than what comes to these uh, grass seed heads over here that you see over here, or what's going to come down here to the uh, uh, to the Russian sage down here. And so different seeds. Uh, different uh, types of flowers, uh, different colors of flowers, they're all going to be slightly different in what they attract uh, to your yard. And so the, the bigger diversity you can get in this uh, setup, the, uh, the more things you'll bring to your, uh, to your landscape. Um, various sizes are best. So you can see here, uh, this is the, the little cone flower over here on the left that uh, one bird will eat. But you can see the, the middle one has those little fluted petals, and that is more likely to attract, say, a hummingbird that uh, can put its beak way into there. You can see over here on the right, we have both grass seeds and the, uh, the echinacea, the coneflower, uh, existing kind of in the same place. Wintertime, uh, you'll see uh, a lot of these uh, plants that you'll plant, uh, the seeds will form the seeds in the, in the late summer or the fall, and over the winter they'll still be there, and the birds, that's when they need uh, that food the most. Okay? And so you'll see you kind of this frozen food uh, of the seed heads over here, and over the left you'll see the grasses. So not only is there uh, food available over there, 
but those grasses actually will, will tip over and, and, and bend over when the snow comes on them uh, to provide, you know, shelter as well. So it's, uh, uh, ormella grasses work really well for this. Uh, berries, so I'm going to talk about a couple of specific plants, but service berries uh, might be my single favorite uh, landscape plant. Uh, you've got, it is a smaller plant, it's a, it's a large shrub, but it uh, kind of functions as a small tree in a lot of ways. Um, Multi-trunk forms uh, can fit almost any lands, any landscape or any size of the landscape. Uh, but you see the service berries over here on the right, that is what they look like in spring, and they're one of the earliest bloomers in the spring. So uh, not a lot of things are blooming uh, when the service berries goes off, and they have this prolific white, uh, very pretty bloom. Uh, they have this fall color too, so they they spend a big chunk of the fall being about as extraordinary as any landscape plant that uh, that I, that you you uh, you might be able to put in your landscape. But importantly, is this fruit that develops. Uh, this fruit is unusual uh, because the berries ripen uh, in the late spring. So instead of being uh, uh, in the fall, uh, like a lot of things ripen up, these actually will ripen up in June, even before summer sets in, and the birds flock to this. Um, these are good eating. I eat these all the time, but you really got to like race the birds to it and, and try to fight them off because uh, um, I've gone, you know, on a three day weekend and come back and had them stripped clean. So there are none left. Uh, this is a Nanking cherry. Nanking cherry is the earliest bloomer in the garden. Uh, this thing will start blooming sometimes in late March uh, in very early April. So it's one of the earliest things to uh, to bloom up. And because of this is actually, again, one of those early things to ripen up. Um, we'll talk about a few things that uh, uh, that ripen and produce berries in the fall, and that is honestly like most things tend to do that. Uh, but these two plants in particular are really kind of valuable because not only do they bloom really early and thus provide kind of an early season uh, uh, pollen for uh, the the, uh, the things we have just coming out of uh, dormancy in the winter time, uh, but their fruit ripens and becomes ready in the late spring before it even becomes summer. Uh, these are golden currants. Uh, you can see again, uh, you've got three seasons of a uh, of, uh, uh, kind of nice out of these. Uh, these uh, yellow flowers here uh, come up in the springtime. Uh, and you see the fall color over here. This is this is, again, this is a native plant uh, to Utah. So native native plants, the best you, if you can find them, attract native pollinators and native bees and native birds uh, because they kind of, they they've evolved knowing what to do with that. Uh, and these are the uh, uh, the berries that ripen up in midsummer, and so this provides a, a good food food source right dead in the middle of summer. The other thing about this plant that is really nice, and if you ever come out to the conservation garden park while it's blooming, is we'll have stands of this golden currant in bloom, and you can smell that from about 300 yards away. They smell really good, and the smell is like uh, uh, fall spices. They're almost like a pumpkin spices. They're nutmeg and cloves and uh, cinnamon that, uh, that, that you get coming off of that. So just a, a really uh, beautiful scent coming off that plant. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, there was a question that came through and I just want to make sure I'm thinking about this correctly. They asked okay. about the variety of echinacea with the fluted petals. And I don't remember seeing that, but I saw a gallardia with yeah. fluted petals. So that one in the middle is a gallardia. And I don't, carnival maybe? Um, yeah, there's a lot of gallardia that look the same. They have that fluted petal. Yeah, but that's not a coneflower. That, well, it's a coneflower, but that's a gallardia rather than echinacea. Yeah. So, okay, I just wanted to make sure I was remembering correctly what was on that slide. Yep, for sure that is a uh, that is a gallardia. Okay, cool. So, Thanks. Which uh, uh, some people might, might know as a uh, blanket flower uh, as a common name. So. Uh, so this is a, a member uh, a same, of the same family as the currants, uh, and these are gooseberries. Uh, gooseberries again ripen in the midsummer uh, and become just a favorite uh, for the birds when they uh, when they find this thing. And I know that the birds love both the currants and the gooseberries because I find currants and gooseberries plants scattered throughout the garden in various places, usually underneath where a bird would have sat and perched as those seeds uh, move through the burden, come out the other end. Uh, and so it's, uh, I know I know how much they love those particular uh, those particular fruits. But again, we've got a couple plants that are early in the year ripening, and these are midsummer ripening. Um, uh, but the, re the real like food uh, for like, 
birds comes up in the in the fall. Uh, but crab apples, uh, their fruit matures in the uh, in the uh, the fall. But in the meantime, uh, in the spring, crab apples have some of the most amazing flowers of any plant anywhere, uh, and they are usually covered with pollinators uh, in the early season. And it just becomes kind of an important food source. Uh, but crab apples come in so many shapes, so many sizes. Um, you can find one that fits into your yard and fits into whatever color scheme, whatever design you're, you're doing. Crab apples might be one of the world's most uh, perfect little landscape plants. And the great thing about them is the scent coming off of these plants is quite amazing. They bloom right about the same time often as like the flowering pears do, and everybody sees flowering pears. And everybody, I think, knows what flowering pears smell like. These, on the other hand, just smell of a typical apple blossom, and they're really, really uh, uh, sweet. Uh, the crab apples, so this is a fall fruit. Um, but the great thing about the crab apples is while they'll, they'll ripen up in the fall, and they will uh, become kind of a really big food source for uh, the passenger birds that are coming through and they're eating on their uh, migration south. Um, but their fruit persists all winter long. You can see this is uh, what their fruit looks like in January and February. The fruit is a little, kind of a little sad looking and you can see it's already been uh, picked a lot because uh, there are a lot of, uh, of those uh, that are like half eaten. But birds will hang out in the uh, the crab apple trees almost all winter long, just snacking on those uh, on those uh, uh, crab apples. Uh, and in fact, the, the three pictures that you're looking at here were taken all taken this week at the garden. Uh, and so these are just some birds with, that uh, have overwintered here in the garden. And this uh, crab apple becomes just an amazing source of food for these guys. So crab apples again, one of really one of the most incredible uh, little landscape plants for for anybody really. Crab apples uh, uh, take on kind of a cool look during the winter time. Uh, all your new crab apples these days are persistent fruit, which means the fruit doesn't just fall off the tree on its own. It needs to be either eaten by a bird or maybe the following year, in the next spring, when the new leaves start to push their way out of the plant. Sometimes they can push the, the fruit off later, but that fruit will kind of sit there um, and, uh, and just sit on that plant all winter long uh, to be a feast for the birds, which is also great because it makes them a little less uh, messy, you know, a little easier to clean up after because they really don't make much of a mess until the following spring. And even then, most of the fruit by then is gone. Mike, uh, Mike, Mike I got another question, if that's okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, the question is, what was the colorful bird on the right picture? So on one of your previous slides, yeah, there. That one, okay. That So I've actually thought about this today while I was kind of updating this, uh, what, updating this one is uh, labeling all the birds. Because um, I talk about the plants, and I, I, it occurred to me at some point uh, that I should label what all these birds are. Uh, and so I will try to mention what birds um, I list uh, as we go through here. Um, it's really it's really a, a presentation about landscaping and not the birds themselves, but I will try to mention some of these birds. Um, but uh, left to right on this one, you've got a uh, dark-eyed junco. Right here in the middle, you've got a black-capped chickadee. And then uh, on the far side, you have the little red one. That is a male house finch. So, and those are year round uh, residents here in Utah. Cool. Thanks, Mike. So, this is a chokeberry. And chokeberry, like a lot of plants that I've mentioned, um, are really gorgeous in the springtime. And these have this gorgeous white flower in the spring. And then they develop this uh, uh, fruit in the fall. Um, the fruit is really not good if I, I pick it off and eat it, but the birds seem to love it. And I hear you can make jam out of it uh, that is really good. Um, I assume you add enough sugar to anything uh, and it tastes really good. So but you can see what the plant looks like over here um, on the right during the year. It's a dense, uh, it's kind of a smallish but dense shrubs and uh, anything that has a really dense canopy on it, birds really love to hang out in. Um, over here on the left, you see the fall color. It is uh, that orange color you see up against the fence. And so this plant develops like this really gorgeous fall color, has beautiful flowers and has really some uh, really nice fruit in the, in the fall time. So uh, again, a, a plant, a, a full, you know, three seasons uh, that you get out of this plant as, as well as attracting the birds to your yard. Um, nuts attract a whole different type of birds. So oak trees, uh, they have acorns, uh, which uh, a lot of jays and a lot of your, your bigger uh, birds tend to eat. Uh, jays will, will constantly be picking at these things in the fall or picking them off, off the ground because the acorns don't last very long. They fall kind of early. 
And uh, the other thing that do, does love them is you do occasionally get squirrels um, after these, which I know squirrels can be a pest, but uh, having squirrels in the yard just means you've got a landscape that is worth visiting. And so having uh, more wildlife for me is better, but uh, I know everybody, uh, not everybody loves the squirrels, but they do tend to attract a little bit of the squirrels. And so do these things. Um, so these, these uh, the jays come and visit quite often too. Uh, this is a yellow horn tree. Uh, this might be one of the few trees uh, that you'd have a hard time getting a hold of, um, but they're worth looking looking around to try to get. The internet's a, a great place to find these, although even then it's a little hard. This tree is a little hard to grow um, in a greenhouse, and so most uh, nurseries don't tend to have these. Thanksgiving Point greenhouse do, does tend to have these periodically though. Uh, mostly because they've they've got some of the seeds off this uh, this tree here, you know, here in this picture, uh, but it's hard for me to express how beautiful this tree is when it's in full bloom. Um, imagine a small tree or a large shrub and it is covered head to toe with those flowers there in the middle. Um, it is really quite spectacular. It develops this fruit um, in midsummer. It looks a little like an orange, but it's not really uh, like an orange. It is more like a hard seed pod. Uh, that you see over here where it contains these little seeds on the inside uh, that look a little and taste a little like uh, small chestnuts. Um, I hear they uh, they can be roasted up and uh, they taste quite good like uh, almost like macadamias. Um, evergreens are one of the best plants you can plant in your yard if you're looking for uh, attracting uh, different types of wildlife and birds um, for a couple of reasons. Juniper berries um, are a favorite. Uh, the birds in the fall, I have seen many birds in the fall, particularly uh, like the migrators come through and just stock up on um, the juniper berries while they're in there. But again, evergreens themselves are great sources of shelter in your landscape. And so if you're looking for shelter in your landscape, evergreens are the way to go because it is a year round, very dense canopy and it's easy for a bird to go in there and kind of hide out uh, and feel safe and secure in those uh, evergreen plants. Um, pines, so again, more evergreens, pines and spruces. Uh, these cones are a good source of food. Uh, this one on the right is a uh, pinion pine, and it's the it's the, the typical pine nut that we get at the store uh, cooked up. That's where those come out. But birds uh, love those, particularly like you get the nut hatches and the uh, and the jays and things that come there and just kind of uh, uh, peel those out of uh, out of those seeds. But all of those all of those cones you see right there are are really good sources of of uh, uh, of uh, seeds for the birds. Uh, but the other thing that lives in uh, evergreens are bugs, uh, for a lot of the same reasons. They uh, they don't lose their leaves. Uh, they're they're kind of alive year round, and so it's a lot of good for a lot of uh, bugs to hang out. So a lot of the birds that eat insects uh, hang out in this tree quite a bit. Uh, you know, trying to get the uh, the little uh, the little bugs hanging out in this thing. Uh, these these are bug eaters right here. So what you're looking at is the uh, the northern flicker in the middle. Uh, the left is a uh, uh, what's called a ruby cap kinglet. And uh, this is a, a, a little downy woodpecker uh, over on the other side. Uh, but these, these love to eat the bugs and evergreens are a really good source of uh, just, having, uh, just having bugs. A lot of little bugs live up in, in those little crevices in those barks. I can see the little king little here on the left it's actually got a little bug in its, uh, its beak. Um, all of these pictures again were taken uh, earlier this week here in the garden. Uh, one of the other key, key resources is water, and there's a, a couple different ways you can add it. You can actually go through, uh, if you're really kind of a hobbyist in it, and put in a pond. Uh, ponds are great. They look natural, uh, and they attract a lot of things uh, uh, to the water, uh, both pollinators and and birds that eat out of it. But if you're not going to go through and put a, put a pond in, and that's fine because they are a lot of work, uh, adding a bird bath is a really good idea. Um, a lot of birds love these low bird baths. Uh, just make sure you put a you know, put them near a shrub for the bird to like run into and hide uh, if the predators come. So uh, and they'll 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 perch often in whatever is nearby uh, to come use the bird baths. Um, shelter. So uh, trying to think about shelter in all the seasons. Ornamental grasses are really good winter shelter, uh, as are evergreens. But ornamental grasses, you can see what's happening over here on the left is the snow has kind of piled over the grass and you see all these little voids. Well, bird goes in there and it's a, basically a big cavern. And because if it had seed heads on it when it folded over, now it's got food in there as well as, as shelter. So uh, ornamental grasses are really a, a good, uh, 
good resource when uh, you're looking to uh, attract uh, some wildlife to your yard. Hey, Mike, I've got another question for you. Yep. Um, you've uh, got some pretty good experience with ponds over the years. Uh, someone's asking, have you heard of people having mosquito issues when they install a pond? So, yes. Um, uh, and if you go to uh, some of the local places that will help you with ponds, like the, uh, you know, like the, uh, the ponds, uh, the pond club here in, in Salt Lake Valley, and there, there's a good one here. And in fact, they do a ponds tour every year where you can go look at everybody else's ponds. Um, and talk to the owners. Yeah, there and there are ways to do it. Um, my experience with ponds is mostly from a distance. Uh, but there are things that people can do about adding uh, movement and uh, so the water's not sitting there stagnant, which attracts the mosquitoes uh, and uh, different fish you can put in to eat the mosquito uh, larva before they become a problem. So it is an issue, yes, uh, but there are ways uh, to get around it as most of the uh, the people who do ponds here in the valley will, uh, will be able to tell you. So definitely yeah. way around it. That makes sense. And uh, one solution that we have at the garden is we've used uh, drilled rock fountains. So there's not an actual like body of water. Right. Um, it's just drilled rocks that have water coming out of the top that still supplies uh, water for the wildlife without having actually having stagnant water. Yeah, that keeps water moving. And so we don't get it stagnant. It's the stagnant water where you get the mosquito problems. So, uh, Evergreens, all types of evergreens uh, work as shelter. And the thing about evergreens is you can find big evergreens, you can find small evergreens, you can find small junipers, small pines, small spruces. Um, over here is just kind of a row of, uh, of junipers out here at the garden. Um, the other one right there in the middle, uh, those are mostly spruces that you see. And over here on the right is a very small uh, pine, which is called a mugo pine. This one's a Karsten's winter gold, and you can see the bright yellow it turns in the wintertime. So again, it really stands out in your landscape, but you can find big, small, medium uh, evergreens. So every yard can use, uh, can use some uh, good evergreens, and there are evergreens uh, available for every size yard that you might have. Uh, and if you want to see them, we have plenty of them out there. Again, all of the pictures in this uh, presentation um, are from out here at the garden. So all of this you can come and see. Uh, this is an Oregon grape. Uh, this is a Utah native plant, but this is an evergreen. This is a broadleaf evergreen. Uh, so broadleaf evergreens uh, have uh, some uh, a cool place where all the in the wintertime, all of that uh, those leaves kind of form a really solid canopy. Um, over the ground and uh, uh, do a lot for uh, the pr protection of the birds. And plus, of course, you've got these bright yellow flowers in the spring and these berries that form up in midsummer that the birds do eat. Uh, this one on the right here is not an urban grape, but it is a t uh, it is a uh, in the same family as a type of Mahonia. But this is Utah's native Mahonia, whose name dropped out of my head just now. Sean, remember this? Is this um, this Fremontii? Fremonts? Yeah, it's either Fremont Mahonia Fremontii or Mahonia hematocarpa. Yeah, I think this one might be the Hemetocarpa. So, yeah, these are all good broadleaf evergreens for the landscape. Uh, any plant with a dense canopy uh, is a good thing to plant in the yard. Uh, on the far right over here is uh, this is a, a globe pea shrub. Again, you see that really dense canopy. And if you look up underneath there, it's almost hollow on the inside, uh, and the birds really like to hang out in there. And it's closer to the ground, which actually a lot like to to kind of hang out there. And there's plenty of birds. Um, out there that actually like to nest closer to the ground uh, because their usual eating habit is to uh, scratch around on the ground uh, looking for insects and so they like to they tend to nest a little closer to the ground. Uh, this middle one of course is sumac uh, which turns this beautiful uh, color here in the in the fall and if you've got an area that certainly you want to um, uh, let go wild and you don't want to maintain the area anymore uh, planting some grolo sumac in the area to take it over is actually not a bad way to go. Uh, over here on this left side, this is a, a viburnum. So it's just a thick leafed, uh, almost a leathery leaf viburnum. Again, some beautiful flowers will form on that plant. Uh, and then uh, it develops again a fruit in the fall. So uh, all these plants just kind of have uh, multiple aspects to them that tend to attract all kinds of things uh, to the landscape. And again, the more diverse you're planting, the, the more different types of plants you're planting, the more you will attract because everything is attracted to a little something different. Plants with thorns. So uh, from left to right, you've got uh, Chinese firethorn or, or pyracantha. 
uh, basically just roses right there in the middle. And this one on the right with the the, uh, the purple leaves is barberry. And there are lots of there are lots of varieties of all of these plants. But plants with thorns, uh, birds love. They go in there uh, and they know, like they seem to instinctively know that those thorns work as protective and things don't really want to dive into the thorny bushes to go get them. And so they know that there's a real protective quality to those thorns. And so a lot of uh, birds are attracted to these things. And of course, you can see they flower and fruit in their own right. So, you know, all kinds of pollinators and all kinds of wildlife just uh, love this kind of a thing. Uh, nesting sites, uh, the evergreens, the, uh, the shrubs, uh, the dense canopies, all of these will lend themselves well to nesting sites. Um, you see in the in the middle here is a, a a bee nesting site, and there are hundreds of native bees to Utah, and and none of them like live in hives. The only hive bee we really have are the honeybees or the uh, the bumblebees. Uh, all the other bees live as solitary, live in little holes. Uh, so leaving leaving a few patches of bare soil open for these uh, for these pollinators to uh, to live in. Uh, is, uh, is is really convenient for them. Um, also, you want to uh, be careful uh, when you're pruning uh, some of the some of the maintenance on them. Um, I'll, I'll actually, I, I think I have a slide here. I'll get to it in, in, in just a moment. But yeah, I almost pruned off those poor little birds on the left. So uh, pollinators. So it's not just about birds. It's not just about squirrels or other things. Uh, butterflies, bees, and other pollinators that'll that'll make their way into their yard, in, into your landscape, uh, just add a sense of movement, a sense of sound, a sense of life uh, to your yard. Um, flowers are pretty, but so are birds, so are butterflies, and so are these other things. And so bringing them in just adds to the attractiveness of of, of, a, of a really good uh, landscape and just a good way to do a local scape. Pollinators and hummingbirds favor nectar-shaped tubes, so you're looking for hummingbirds and, and bees, these, th these, uh, these shapes that have the tubes on them are, are a good way to get the hummingbirds to come on out. Uh, and these are providing mostly nectars. Pollinators, and you get more hummingbirds that like these ray flowers. So this is the, this is the sunflowers or the echinaceas. Uh, and so not only do the, the, uh, the, the bees, the butterflies all love these flowers, uh, but when they ripen, they develop into a, a good seed that will, again, will sit there all winter, basically until the birds eat them. But uh, uh, hummingbirds, butterflies, uh, they all feed off of many different types of flowers and flowering shrubs. Um, there is some studies I've seen over the years um, uh, from uh, some universities that looked at pollinators, bees, butterflies, and, and anything that visits these things. Uh, they looked at uh, herbaceous perennials, native herbaceous perennials, native shrubs, native uh, uh, trees, things like that. And far and away, more pollinators got counted on woody plants. So the trees and the shrubs, those are the flowers that attract the most uh, different types of pollinators, bees, butterflies, things like that, to, to your landscape. So when you're putting it in, keep that in mind. Uh, the backbone of any good, like any good landscape, is going to be in those flowering shrubs, and then you're going to fill in with the perennials. Uh, so keep keep in mind that the more of the uh, flowering shrubs you have, probably the more pollinators you're going to bring in, because they just attract that many more. Uh, so milkweed specifically is a uh, uh, an important plant uh, if you're going to try to make your uh, uh, yard into a really good haven uh, for. Uh, uh, for landscapes, you know, or for, for bugs and pollinators. Um, monarchs, butterflies are endangered and they only eat milkweed. It's the only thing that the baby uh, baby caterpillars eat. And so putting in uh, the uh, milkweed to your yard is a really good way to help um, your yard become that way station uh, for, the, uh, for the butterflies that, that really do need um, that plant that used to grow in the wild and again, habitat loss. You have this, you know, quarter of an acre yard, you have this, this space that you have that you could provide you know this kind of food and make your make your uh, uh, and return that habitat to the local environment uh, this on the far left is a uh, what they call a, a butterfly weed you see in the store or butterfly flower you see at the store I mean it, it comes in many different colors it does attract the monarchs too I've seen the uh, the caterpillars living on them uh, but by far the most are going to be attracted to these ones in the middle and on the end uh, this is just the native showy milkweed 
Uh, so any of these you can put in your yard makes your uh, yard a haven for the monarch butterflies, uh, which would be a, a good thing. Uh, you'll, when it comes to maintenance, um, this is where I think some people get a little intimidated. Uh, I think we've all grew up knowing how to mow lawns, maybe edge lawns, things like that. And so taking care of a, a landscape like this can be a, le a little intimidating. We do teach classes here. You can come out and ask questions here. Um, but I think the biggest thing you probably need to pick up is pruning. Uh, again, be careful when you start pruning. Um, I almost pruned off this branch for this, uh, these uh, little uh, uh, feathered friends here in this little nest. And I you know, just kind of held off, waited about three weeks, came back, the birds had fledged and gone, and then I was able to finish uh, what I was trying to do to that shrub. So uh, it's worth uh, keeping an eye out and, and uh, uh, watching out for uh, the nest that we're trying to encourage here. Uh, maintenance, one of the, the, the best things about this is you don't always have to make your yard look perfect. You don't always have to clean it up uh, immaculately. Um, you can see that we've left up the seed heads over the winter uh, over here on the right. And that is for the birds to eat those seeds because those seed heads you're looking at um, still have seeds in them. The birds can uh, visit all winter long and eat those. Uh, the leaf litter on the ground is great because lots of things overwinter in leaf litter. Um, the leaf litter will contain a lot of bugs. And so out here pretty much all winter long, uh, we've got we've got birds out here uh, every day uh, scratching around, scratching around into these uh, leafy areas, uh, looking for the overwintering insects, and this becomes quite the food source. It also becomes a good source of nesting material um, as the season uh, turns into spring. So, but don't clean up everything immaculate. You can see what we've got here uh, is lots of little birds that seem to spend all their time just kind of uh, in the leaf litter on the ground. Uh, so for the people who are asking about the birds, the, the birds uh, ident identification, this one on the right is a spotted tohi. This one in the middle is a uh, is a junco, and this one on the uh, left is our native uh, a sparrow. So don't cut all the flowers down; leave them up for the winter. All of these seed heads you see here are seeds, and birds will definitely visit your yard to eat these. Um, a bit of a pro tip: layering plants works really well. You can see this is two examples of just plants. So you're planted small, then medium, and then big, and then bigger, like as you go. And so now it's just creating like a nice visual appeal, uh, especially when there's lots of things blooming and you've got different shapes, different texture, uh, and different colors depending on what is blooming. Uh, but this kind of layering really does attract the wildlife because they can hop from one thing to the other as they go. And so layering the plants is uh, really does attract some additional things to your to your landscape. Um, but if you're attracting birds, you know, to your landscape, possibly squirrels to your landscape, you do end up with these. And these are birds too. And uh, these are really uh, fascinating to watch. Um, I can go out to the garden at any point and find uh, these, again, these were all taken in the garden. Um, and find the Cooper's Hawk is pretty regular. That's the one uh, a third from the left. Uh, but the, the owls, the, the we can see here uh, almost year round. The Cooper's Hawk is we see uh, frequently during the uh, during the winter time like this and the kestrels that we get uh, most of the year as well. Uh, they're always out there hunting birds and uh, roaming through the garden. So when you create a haven for wildlife, you attract more wildlife. So one of the other tips is the more square footage you use in this type of landscape and the more you will attract. So the bigger the footprint is of this, the more will show up to, uh, to visit and the more different things you plant, the more diversity is created, the more the more plants you get. So uh, getting the neighbors involved, having your quarter acre lot um, set up this way is great. Having three or four quarter acre lots in your neighborhood is better because everybody has a different style, everybody has different plants that they like, and all of those plants can attract something a little different. And if they're visiting their neighbor's yard, they will visit yours as uh, is not far away and so getting your neighbors involved is a really good way i know that's uh, that's hard but the more people you can get to do this uh, in one spot the bigger that footprint becomes the more birds and the more diversity you're going to they're going to create okay um the next few slides i just kind of want to kind of want you guys to absorb like some of the yards that have done this um over the years and how beautiful like this can actually be I mean, who wouldn't, want, who wouldn't want to walk down that sidewalk over there to the right? You know, that, that's just a, such a, a pleasant experience. Okay. Again, the more plants, the bigger the footprint, the more biodiversity that you add, the more life that you will uh, add to your to your landscape. And just more life is just better. 
by the way, this uh, uh, this is a bee on the right. On the left, that is not a bee. Uh, I took that picture uh, when I uh, it took me a couple of years to realize that what I'm looking at is actually a hoverfly, not a not an actual bee. That is actually a fly. Look at the way the wings are held, and look at the eyes. It's not actually a bee, but uh, it sure looks like one. A lot of these pictures were taken pretty recently here in the garden. The quail we get here all the time, the, the sparrows, and of course we get squirrels. They can be a bit of a pest, but uh, I've never found them to be too destructive. A little spot of towhee there on the left. Uh, that bird on the top um, with the yellow, uh, we looked that one up. That is a uh, uh, yellow rump warbler. That was actually the first time I've ever, ever seen that bird uh, that we saw here just last week. So that is that is a new one to uh, to my uh, uh, spotted list. You can see all kinds of things attract all kinds of different different creatures. That one on the far left uh, is a uh, cedar waxwing. They tend to come through in the fall, maybe uh, hang out during the winter a little bit. So, uh, but they really like their berries. Again, another house finch over there on the left, and some doves. That junco on the side. Um, a few years ago, we managed to get a picture of a bald eagle. I tend to see them all the time here, flying over. So they're pretty common, uh, but uh, uh, at least during the winter time. But. Uh, Again, all these taken in the garden, just the level of diversity that we get here is great. And we are right in the middle of West Jordan, so I know you guys can do it. So this is kind of how I want to leave you, is that uh, how we landscape really is a choice. What we try to do with that landscape is really a choice. And I think for years we've kind of had one way to do things. It was, uh, it's based on some, uh, you know, some thinking that was, that was brought over. But I think where we're at now with uh, water situations, um, with climate being changing a little bit, I think we need to start moving towards something a little different. And local scapes is really a good way uh, to help you think about uh, the way your yard's gonna be. And then choosing one uh, uh, that adds a little something to the plants, like the like the pollinators, and it attracts the birds and attracts other wildlife that makes your 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 house uh, an invitation to life to come visit. I mean, all this life and, and beauty is just really worth having and surrounding yourself with. Uh, and so. I really think this is the way to go, or we'd go back to this. And you know, I have my opinion on this one. So, all right, so that is it for me. I think Sean might have some questions now. Let's see. Here's a good question, Mike. Something that we have a lot of good experience with in the last couple of years. A uh, person likes the idea of a drilled rock fountain, but worries that it wastes water. Uh, but our theory was it uh, the circulation doesn't really lose much. All it does is lose much evaporation. So we actually put in several here and then put a meter on it to see what we use. And I'm here to tell you, we do not use much. In fact, we have a fairly big uh, drilled rock fountain out there with several outlets to it. And I'm gonna have Sean quote the exact number because I don't remember, but it isn't a lot, at least relative to how much water we would use in a similar area in a single irrigation. So Sean, do you remember that number? Yeah, so um, I'm just going to put it into perspective for everyone, just to give you an idea of how much water we're talking about. So the average person, when they water their lawn just one time in a week, and they run through all their zones, turn on all their valves, water their whole yard, it uses five to 6,000 gallons of water every time they do that. So they're doing that several times a week, right? A drilled rock fountain that we have at the garden, um, we have it metered, it'll use 100 gallons, maybe 150 gallons in an entire year. Uh, so that's just a tiny teardrop in a bucket of water compared to how much water is being used in the rest of the landscape. And that's mainly because it's just being recirculated. We're not actually 
pouring it down a drain or anything like that. I mean, there's a little evaporation that happens, but it's being recirculated. And that and that uh, that pond that we're talking about, that pondless feature we've got out there, is actually pretty significantly sized. It is not a small one. It has got, I think, four outlets that fill different holes, and so it comes up in, in various spots. So uh, the fact that it uses so little water, in fact, I think it even surprised us how little it actually used. So we, we thought it would use a little, and we were surprised at how actual little it did use. So no, I, I wouldn't worry too much about um, drill rock fountains. They actually don't use that much water. Yeah, and we've got another fountain in our local scapes exhibit. It's a smaller fountain. Uh, it kind of looks almost similar to a bird bath. Um, but it only uses like 50 gallons in a whole year. It's just not a lot of water. Um, here's a good question just about plant spacing. Um, if you are laying out plants in a, in a landscape, Mike, how, how much would you worry about spacing to make sure you get a full look without like overcrowding? Yeah, it, it, that's a, I mean, that's a delicate dance that, uh, that you do. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of what we're talking about here with birds and pollinators, they kind of like a little overcrowding. Um, but uh, uh, so the, the short answer is might be just to, to look at the tags, figure how close they need to be and stick relatively close to that. Because we have found over the years that that's pretty good estimation to how big they're going to get. But they tend to get in my, in like at least what our experience out here is, a little bit even bigger than I think what we see on the tags for for a bit. So I think if you went on the tags, you'd be relatively sure to get a decent canopy, uh, but not too overcrowded. So, but yeah, it is that is a delicate uh, uh, dance to do. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, and I, I actually think we tend to um, put things put plants a little bit closer together yeah. than the average person does. Uh, knowing that uh, plants will grow up and then we'll selectively pull plants out later as needed. Yeah. And you never know if a plant's going to survive in a spot or if you put, you know, eight of them in one spot, like maybe two of them die. And so, yeah, we, we tend to crowd them a little bit, but we've not really found a problem with that. So. Uh, do you have any service berry varieties or cultivars you like, Mike? Um, so sure, um, all of them is the short answer. The long answer is the uh, the Grand Flora hybrids is really uh, really exceptional. So we're talking about the Autumn Brilliance service berries. Uh, there is a service berry out here called, and I'm see if I can get Sean to help me remember the name. Uh, it's the Pillar one. It is the um, it's um, is it Obelisk? Yeah, it's called Obelisk. That's right. And that service berry is. Kind of a, a narrow columnar one and so it's a little smaller for a smaller landscape um but yeah overall i would say the uh, the autumn brilliance we've had some really good success with over the years and it has some really amazing fall color on it so it, it uh the other name that's coming to my mind is standing ovation right is, is that familiar is that the service berry or is it obelisk i can't remember for sure so standing ovation is a little blue stem i believe Oh, that's right. Okay. Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, someone's asking about uh, a park strip setting mm -hmm. uh, where they've got big, massive trees mm -hmm. uh, and they've got big roots. Is there like plants that you would suggest uh, going under those trees that can handle like not a lot of soil because there's so many roots? Um, so yeah, I guess I'd be looking at that point at some uh, smaller, shorter root, uh, plants with fibrous root systems. So what would I be talking about here? Like desert zinnias that have a really uh, tight uh, root system. Um, your garden geraniums, I think, would probably do well in, in a situation like that. I'm assuming there's not tons of shade. It's more just a, an absence of soil on top is what I'm hearing is the problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's there's lots of small, and you'd be looking for things that don't have big tap roots. A peony probably wouldn't do well here because it develops a, a fairly significant root. So you'd be looking for things that have smaller root system. Uh, you know, the the Gallardia blanket flowers, or the uh, um, the uh, chocolate flowers, or the uh, uh, Sundancer daisies should all do well here. But yeah, you're definitely looking for smaller and and ones with a more extensive root system on it uh, in order to be able to help find that what soil they do have. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's lots of ground covers that do well in those situations too. 
Yeah, and it might try at that point to start growing them with seeds so they have a chance to like uh, grow in there without having to dig a, a four inch hole, so. Yeah, um, there's someone that uh, sounds like they live in an HOA that doesn't allow a lot of this. Uh, wondering if we have any tips on how to approach that issue. So yeah, there's 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 a few ways uh, that you can go about it. I mean, you can you can go. Um, we've had people bring their HOA uh, board on a tour of this place, um, and so we've we've been able to just walk them around to show them what we're really thinking. Because I think what happens is people aren't sure about it. They don't know what it looks like. Um, they don't know what to expect. It's a little out of their comfort zone. But if you bring them to us, uh, we might be able to help you out with that. Um, one of the other things I've suggested to, to people. Um, is HOA boards are just made up of people who live in the HOA, uh, as you do, run for the board and start changing it from within. Um, and sometimes that's really the best way to go about it. I think I've seen um, somebody, uh, a law got proposed here in Utah that would prevent HOAs from making more restrictive landscape rules than the city that the HOA exists in. I don't know the status on that. I think something like that would be a really good idea, but educating them, bringing them out here if they want to come, or like I said, if all, if all it fails, run for the board and become the board yourself. So, Yep. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to wrap this up, but by addressing a few things here, there's been a questions about the local scapes classes. Uh, if anyone's interested in the local scapes classes, uh, we will be teaching them uh, this year. Um, so the main class people are probably interested in is Local Scapes University. Um, there's several ways that you can take that class. It is on our website on demand, so you can go to either the Gardens website or localscapes.com and you can just play the class um, uh, live on your computer, a recorded version, and watch that anytime you want. Um, we'll be doing Local Scapes University via this way on WebEx during certain portions of the year. And I believe we do have one scheduled at the garden itself later on in the year. Um, let's see. Someone asked, uh, someone asked about what do you do with bird baths and water features in the winter with freezing temperatures? Well, so a couple of approaches you can take with this is you can regularly go out and refill it. Birds would love you if you did. Uh, that, that water in the winter is actually more valuable than it is even in the summertime uh, because it's so much harder to find water. So yeah, if you wanted to go out there, move the ice out and keep filling it, just like you do a bird feeder, um, they would actually love it if you would do that. Um, otherwise, if you think it'll break down or break, uh, you can break them down and put them in the basement or the garage so they don't freeze. Um, or just don't fill them, uh, depending on the materials made out of. But uh, if you want my real advice, uh, wintertime is a good time to attract birds, and water is one of the big things that'll do that, especially in the wintertime. So, 